So I know I'm kind of late on the scene to do a review for Final Fantasy XV, uh, but I waited until it came out on Windows to play it, and I just completed the story, and man, do I have a few things to say about Final Fantasy XV. So here we are. So I have played, in completion, Final Fantasy 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 10 2, or X2. And so I was really excited to play Final Fantasy 15. And I have a lot to say about it. Both the good, and there's a lot of good, and the bad, and there is some of that. And so just a heads up too, this review will be filled with spoilers. So if you don't want to hear what's happening in the game, you haven't finished it yet, tune out, you've been warned. Okay, let's start with the good things about Final Fantasy XV. And there were a lot of good things about this game. First of all, the visuals. As someone who hasn't completed a Final Fantasy since What's X2, my so eyeballs just about exploded like into confetti the first time I laid eyes on the open world of this beautiful game. Everything from the horizon, to the movement, to the reflection of the water, to the shadows, the wind, the way the little blades of grass kicked up when you were walking. It was all unbelievably awesome to me. I was so impressed. And walking or driving or chocoboing around it was like exploring some kind of realistic dreamland, actually, for me. Even the weather changes were impressive. Major, major points to Square Enix for the beauty and the gorgeously creative scenes and landscapes of this game. It is beautiful. The Brotherhood. The real love story in this game is not a romantic story between Noct and his fiance, which we'll talk more about later, but instead it's between Noct and these three buddies, these three friends who loyally stand by his side no matter what he's going through throughout the entire game, and it totally works. You may have noticed, but I am female, and I wasn't sure if I was actually going to connect to the idea of four dudes on a road trip, but I totally did. And maybe part of that is because growing up I was a huge Ninja Turtle fan, and these four guys are basically human reincarnates of Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael before Michael Bay put them through a wood chipper. But I really did love the chemistry between these four guys. Even to the point of being bothered when other people like Iris joined the party. Thank goodness you guys could give me a lift. We got this, Iris. Go grow some carrots. The characters. I didn't expect this one at all, but I could honestly say that I loved the main characters, especially Ignis and Prompto. I liked Noct too, and while Gladio didn't really thrill me, I could see that his edgy, protective, and harsh dynamic was kind of necessary to glue the four together into a brotherhood. She gave her life so you could do your duty, not so you could sit around feeling sorry for yourself. You don't think I know that? You don't! When the game be first began, anytime Ignis spoke, I was like, yeah, Whatever, Butler, thanks for that. But then eventually over time, he really started to grow on me and he's my favorite now. And spoiler alert, by the time he lost his sight in that accident. You're hurt. Oh, small sacrifice. I found myself feeling legitimate sorrow for him. Um, so much, in fact, that the next day at work, I was bummed out and I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized it was because I was bummed that Ignis was blind and I wanted to get home and forward the story as soon as possible to make sure that he was okay. So good job to Square Enix for making me care so much about a fictional video game character that I actually felt some sadness at work the next day. Knocked. I have an idea. If I may. Ugh. Ah, as I suspected. It really worked. Nice one, Iggy. And Prompto too. So at the beginning of the game, I was kind of worried that Prompto was going to give me flashbacks of the weird laughing scene in Final Fantasy X. <laughs> But over time, as cheesy as Prompto's enthusiastic comments and jokes were, they became endearing to me, like watching your grandma try to play Tetris. Pretty sweet, busting up that bass. <gasps> bust a bass. I like the sound of that for this sort of thing. Now, there's a bass, we go in and bust it up. Bust a bass. Whatever, I'm calling it that. You don't have to. I won't. And how he reacted to chocobos, like a four-year-old girl would react to maybe seeing a baby duck. <gasps> O-M-G, most adorable bird ever. And he was really the only outwardly cuddly character okay? of the four. 
And even though I rolled my eyes at him, sometimes I was usually I smiling when I did it, because Prompto's kind of a cute character. Hey, you all right? Are you hot? I I'm fine. <clears throat> Thank you, Noct. No sweat. Tell me, were you worried about me? Of course I was. What kind of question is that? <laughs> of course. That's why you came. Prompto's photography. I thought it was a really unique way to capture the journey of gameplay. Oh yeah! Seaside supermodels! Don't get me wrong, Prompto takes a lot of failed Ready photos, up. like close-ups of leaves or maybe random appendages, but in the mix are a few hidden gems that are actually fun to go back and look at later. And as a compliment to the ending, and one of the only compliments I'll give to the ending, I loved the idea of having you flip through all your photos to pick a favorite one before continuing into the final battle. It really made you feel like you were actually looking back through a photo album of a road trip with your friends. Now, I played along with the sentiments and I ended up picking the hero pose taken of the four guys in front of Altisha on the boat as my final remembrance photo, but I find it hilarious that other gamers have used pictures like of Cindy or of Gladio's butt as their final remembrance photo, so good for them. Noct's arc. Unlike most RPGs that I've played, I actually felt like Noct had a character arc, and I really appreciated that. He starts out as an emo, cocky teenager kind of a guy. I'm sick of this endless walking. But then he actually grows into a calmer, selfless kind of king. You start to see hints of that in interactions, like with the Altitia government leader lady. Granted, you don't pick the jerk responses. And then you really saw Nox arc in his interactions with comrades and insomnia before the final battles. We've all lost friends and loved ones along the way. But the one thing we never lost was hope. And while it would have been nice to see this fleshed out even more without using uh, crystal kidnapping and time jump to explain it, it was still pleasantly surprising to see any kind of character development in the leading guy. This is my ascension. The main character voice acting. As a filmmaker with some experience in this area, I was pleasantly surprised by the quality of the main character voice acting and the off-the-cuff casual dialogue. That thing's like... Half bird, half storm, half airship. You realize that's three halves. Sure, it wasn't perfect. Why wouldn't I? But it was good enough to entertain me and to pull me into the story as being plausible and human. Let's be frank. My vision hasn't improved and probably won't. Yet in spite of this, I would remain with you all. To the very end. <laughs> Sorry, but I object. War is a matter of life and death. But we'll be it's there. It's not about us looking out for him. Uh-huh. Well, then he should be free to choose. There's more to it than just what he wants. I know full well. I won't ask you to slow down. If I cannot keep up, I will bow out. <sighs> what says his majesty? Noct. You are king. One cannot lead by standing still. A king pushes onward, always, accepting the consequences and never looking back. Gladio, Noct will take his rightful place, but only once he's ready. Even though this world is one of fantasy, it's the humanistic relatability of the characters that really pulls us in and gets us involved. The boss fights. In fact, all the beasts and the demons in general. My husband and I loved flipping through the bestiary in the archives and just looking at the imaginative art of all the creatures that you fight during the game. And I remember when I first fought Titan, the first major massive boss fight event, and my heart was beating out of my chest. It was so crazy. I was blown away by the scale of the fight, and I was equally blown away by the creativity and the art involved. And that was just an early fight. Fighting Leviathan later was like being launched into space unexpectedly on your scooter. You can even 
can choose to fight a mountain, an actual mountain, as one of the Beast Hunt side quests. Dude, you can't be serious! Oh crap, you are! And I think that my ultimate favorite boss fight moment took place in Chapter 14, when the four members of the Brotherhood united to battle the kings of the past. Even though I was a bit confused as to why we were fighting old dead relatives who were supposed to be on our side, I let my confusion slide as each member of the party took a turn to kick some trash, and I just about jumped out of my seat when Ignis said, no mercy, and then the group unleashed a can of Destructo Awesome. Come on, Iggy! No mercy! It's over. It was so cool. The choreography and the visuals were outstanding, but more importantly, that moment showcased the emotional connection that makes us love the game. The loyal brotherhood of Gladio, Prompto, Ignis, and Noct. And that emotional triumph was a euphoric peak that just friggin' rocked. There were a lot of other things I really liked about this game, like the beautiful music score that fits well with its famously composed predecessors, or the way Golden Quay looked after the 10 year time jump when darkness had taken over. It was legitimately terrifying, especially when compared to the gorgeous layout we had become familiar with before. Ignis's cooking was fun, I even liked fishing, the Let's chocobos go. were adorable and they paid homage to the series, and the ascension grid was a great way to increase your skills and keep a goal in mind, similar to the sphere grid I had really grown to love in Final Fantasy X. And then there were those hidden gem moments, like cool. seeing the giant whale jump in the open ocean, which was proof that the creators were willing to take time to connect us with the beauty of their world and see things through the character's eyes, something that other games might skip over because they find it insignificant, when in reality, for me, these small moments enhance the experience significantly. But of course, just as A New Hope has The Last Jedi, so too must Final Fantasy XV's awesomeness come with its crappiness. Now it's time to go over the bad stuff. Bad thing number one, the relationship between Noct and Luna Freya. I actually didn't mind Luna Freya as a person. Her general courage and her self-sacrifice gave her potential to be likable but I never really found out who she really was or what her weaknesses were that would have made her relatable and human. And I definitely didn't know much about her relationship with Noct, nor why I should care about it. All we got were a few flashbacks of Noct and Luna as children, word of a politically arranged marriage, and then a few pigeon letters that were passed back and forth on a dog's back, which meant that we were supposed to be on board with their relationship. Well. Sorry, but you can try to tell my brain all day long that two people have chemistry, but unless I'm actually emotionally connecting to that chemistry as I see it unfold during a story, it doesn't work. Even when a tear fell down Nock's face as he watched Luna give her final mortal speech, Luna showed virtually no reaction in seeing him for the first time in forever, and there was no sweet embrace or even a personal gesture afterwards until she was dead and floating in a gorgeously confusing blue flower petal fantasy land. Honestly, I wouldn't be so bothered by the lack of this relationship if the story didn't insist on putting so much focus on it during the ending. Oh, the ending. <laughs> I'm not ready to talk about that yet, but we're getting there. Accidental jumping. This is a minor thing, but it punched me in the face enough times throughout the game that I'll be doing my soul an injustice if I fail to bring it up. Either I'm an idiot who can't adequately use an Xbox controller, which is completely possible, or programming the action command on the same button as the jump command is worse than escargot ice cream. I would say that a quarter of the times that I tried to pick something up, talk to someone, or crawl under something, Nox thought I wanted to do jumping jacks. It didn't matter if a written action prompt said to push A to talk. Noct was really just thinking to himself, nah, I'm the king. I would rather jump up and down for no good reason. It was so annoying. Who the heck is Arden? 
Other than a crossbreed of Jack Sparrow and Cruella de Vil, I couldn't figure out who in the world Arden was, nor what his backstory was. Not to mention, I couldn't even tell if he was the main villain or not. Was he the bad guy, or was the Emperor the bad guy? Or was Luna Freya's brother the bad guy? Who is the bad guy? Okay, I think it's Arden. But then what happened to the Emperor? Did they run out of budget and have to cut him out of the end of the story? Arden had potential to be interesting with the idea that he could be a past royal relative who started out good until he was basically infected with bad or something. <laughs> it was really just never flushed out and I could never really jump on board. Chapter Pacing while I really enjoyed the first eight chapters, despite its repetitiveness of some of the side quests, pacing kind of spins out of control once you hit chapter nine. Suddenly you go from wide, explorable landscapes filled with side quests and prime locations for leveling up, to being launched into a linear story vortex. It's like we're warping to another dimension. Chapter nine throws you into chapter 10, which quickly throws you into chapter 11, which quickly throws you into chapter 12, and so on and so forth. I enjoyed the story moments, but I was taken aback by the sudden change in pace, and I nearly panicked that I was going to be forced to complete the game before I intended to, until I realized I could take advantage of Umbra's time warps to the past. Now, Umbra may have been a sloppy afterthought added by the game creators, but I would have been much more irked had he not existed. <laughs> Side characters. The side characters in Final Fantasy XV were close to good, but they didn't quite hit the mark for me. While Cindy's face was cute, she was a bit on the nose as an attempt to just make guys drool. A cute girl who also works on cars? Can it be possible? Yes, all over America. But more than that, she was really just an excuse to show boobs all the time. As somebody who doesn't really care about boobs, there seemed to be no rhyme or reason for Cindy, an auto mechanic, to be working on cars wearing nothing but a bra and a jacket that was eight sizes too small for her. If I walked into a Jiffy Loop and I saw somebody dressed like that, I would call the police and report prostitution. As for Iris, I wanted to like her, but she was unfortunately one note and unrelatable for me, despite my appreciation for cuteness. And while the side character voice acting was generally a step up from past games, it's still a little too cartoon and not natural enough for me. My biggest pet peeve, though, is when adults voice children characters, which happened back in Final Fantasy X, he just had a blitz, and was unfortunately repeated here in Final Fantasy XV. But you want to know what else she liked? Cool stickers. Though I did surprisingly enjoy some of the side character acting, like the performance of Talca after he grows up to be an adult. So props to that random actor. Welcome back, Your Majesty. And finally, the most disappointing thing about Final Fantasy XV, the thing that made me want to sue Japan, was the ending. <laughs> I spent 163 hours with four beloved characters, and I was relishing the day when the Brotherhood would push their way through the final battles, defeat Arden, where we would finally learn who the heck he was, and then Noct would take his rightful place on the throne, willing to sacrifice the rest of his life in service to rebuilding insomnia and bringing peace to the land, even without a romantic companion by his side, where we would actually get to see our characters in the city of Insomnia after it had been rebuilt. The name of the quest was a cure for insomnia. We never saw that cure. It was never cured. We had heard and we had talked about insomnia the entire game, destroyed Magitex and defeated monsters outside of its gates, but we had to wait until chapter 14 to actually see the place in person. And even then, it was a pile of flaming rubble. Really cool looking rubble, but rubble nonetheless. Even that one load screen made it seem like someday we were working toward that ending. And that was the ending I wanted. But instead of a beautiful payoff to all the hard work and anticipation, they took all the story's potential and they flushed it down the toilet. A very sad, confusing toilet. Okay. 
I'm not saying that the ending had to be completely happy or anything like that. We don't need to give the four main characters medals on the steps of the palace and then Iggy's sight is miraculously healed by some blue flower petals or something. But you gotta pay off some sort of redemption regarding the love we have of the bond between the four principal characters. Instead, the only supposedly happy payoff was not sacrificing his life for some unclear reason, only to end up in an eternal sleep next to the supposed love interest none of us really bought into. So the payoff we got was the one we didn't care about, which felt like a punch in the face. And all the other payoffs we wanted, like seeing Noct sacrifice his life metaphorically to heal insomnia, and seeing the bond between the Brotherhood live on, were untouched. Rather, the opposite is what happened. And we were given more time earlier in the game to mourn that random Jared character than the end of the Brotherhood that we actually really cared about. Poor Jared. Jared's the one we ought to thank. All thanks to Jared. Justice for Jared. Thanks for everything. The last time we see the Brotherhood, it's during the credits, and they're gathered around the campfire in some vague point in time. Noct then struggles to express the love he has for the guys, but he doesn't quite get there, and then it's depressingly over. Literally, the very last time we see Prompto, he is crying. Again, I don't think everything needs to be happy. I like the idea of Noct struggling to express the love he has for his friends before he departs on a difficult mission that he may not come back from. I like the idea of Prompto crying in concern and sadness for his friend, but that shouldn't be the last way we see Prompto. You can't leave us on a depressing note and think that by seeing Noct reunited with Luna on the title screen with a brighter background and mockingly happier music that we're not going to feel a little cheated. Or let's compromise. If they insist on Noct dying, okay, fine. But hint as to why he has to die beforehand. Help us to understand that this journey is leading to an important self-sacrifice. Don't just kill the main character and expect us to be on board without any explanation. If you insist that Nock die, then at least leave the ending redemptive with the remaining three members of the Brotherhood oh, yeah. maybe longing in sadness, but also yes. greatly proud of the sacrifice their dear king and their close oh, friend made for the good of the people, and then show how it really changed the world for good. You can still have the sadness if you combine it with at least a little hope. Though I still don't think Nox should have died. This is really just a band-aid over a broadsword wound for me. The world's a okay, place. I know it's a you Final Fantasy. Ah, Each game has had their story relate. vagueness and plot you holes and elements it. left to interpretation, oh, and they rarely pay off everything I wish they would. And maybe I should have expected that with Final Fantasy XV. And I did, to, to be honest, at first. But then, over time, I felt myself relating to the characters more closely than I have in the past. I was pulled into the story enough to dare to hope that this one would actually pay off in the end. Parts of the game told me it would. Okay, Iris called Noct when he appeared after a 10-year absence, and she said she had something to tell him later. There's something I wanted to talk with you about. What? It can wait. I'd rather talk about it in person. That made me think that there would be a later. But there wasn't, so what was the point? Though I'm glad those two didn't end up together because, no. And what happened to Cindy? I didn't even like her much, but I expected there to be some closure with her. And what about Aranea? She was cool, but I guess her entire purpose in the game was just to be cool. And what was with all these random hints about not finding Luna Freya's body yet? Did that mean that she was actually possibly alive? Still no sign of Lady Luna Freya anywhere. Hopefully we hear some good news about Lady Luna Freya before then. I hope she's okay. First Secretary Klaustra also pledged the government would continue its search for Lady Luna Freya, whose current whereabouts remain unknown. Or was that just scripting that the game makers forgot to remove once they figured out which direction the end was actually going to go in? Regardless, the further the ending progressed, the more confused I was. What is that? It's like the writers were making up the rules as they went, but they weren't explaining any of them. Like the appropriately named TV series Lost. 
So, Noct goes into this crystal land to destroy a demonic Arden, but then he has to be stabbed by an apparition of his dead relatives, culminating with his father to save the kingdom, but then die himself. What? Why? Why is this happening? Why? Where was the information setting any of this up? And now we have to watch a reunion with some girl that we don't care about while the Brotherhood is forgotten? Are you kidding me? Okay. Even though I'm bashing the end of this game, perhaps the game creators should take this as a compliment. They did a lot of things right. This game is crazy fun. Even after I beat the story, I'm still playing. They made me care so much about these four fictional characters in a fantasy world that I became emotionally invested enough to be affected by its ending, for better or for worse. I care enough to spend time making a video that probably nobody will see just because I need to get this out of my system. I'll miss it once this road trip's over with. That being said, I heard a few months ago that the director of the game asked fans if they wanted a new ending created. The answer is a big fat yes. Give us the ending we were hoping for. I will be happy to pretend that the ambiguous collection of beautifully deceptive cutscenes at the end never existed if I can play a repaired alternative ending and see the character's redemption and hope and storyline pay off. Call me. I will help you write it if that's this what time. it takes. Just give us fans the closure we're looking for when we play games to escape. Not so we can be thrown into additional sadness and ambiguity that our real lives already often encounter. In the meantime, thank you for making a game amazing enough for me to care about. I will be watching the DLC closely.